the infusion of power that Paul is praying for for this church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was a unique church. Um, it's interesting that it's so the, the city of Ephesus is so well preserved. I every time I study Ephesus, I go on YouTube and I look to find tours and things. Uh, you know, there's a one video I saw that shows the house where they believe Mary lived and John uh, as her protector. Um, I looked uh, at the Agora, the place where the Christians would have shopped. Uh, I saw images of the temple of Artemis, uh, the goddess Diana, which is mentioned in Acts chapter 19, which caused Paul so much consternation when he was there, and people were turning from the goddess Diana to um, to Jesus Christ and the silversmiths and the people who made the images were losing business hand over fist because of what Jesus was doing in the lives of people there. Um, it's just a, it's an amazing. Um, probably Luke went to Ephesus. Uh, he probably studied at the library there in Ephesus. Doctor Luke. That's what some people think. That would have been a place he would have gone to study his his craft. So it's a unique location, and Paul clearly had an impact there, and the believers there. Um, were people Paul loved. He spent a long time in Ephesus uh, ministering there. He spent over three years in Ephesus ministering daily in the, first of all, in the, in the synagogue and then in the temple, um, uh, the, like the, the village, uh, well, a village hall kind of a place that they rented out to. And, and most theologians think that Paul probably worked at his craft of, um, a ship, of uh, net, build, net making and stuff for fishing uh, in the mornings. And then in the afternoon, he would go to the uh, hall and entertain questions and share Christ with people who uh, were coming through. It was a very cosmopolitan kind of place, a very modern city for its day. One of the largest cities outside, I think, it was, I, think I read somewhere it was like the fourth largest city in the Roman, um, in the Roman domain. Uh, I'm not sure who was ahead of it, but obviously Rome was the largest, but uh, I think I said, saw somewhere that at one point they estimated that somewhere over 200,000 people lived in the metropolitan Ephesus area. A beautiful city, marbled street that would go from the center of the, from the, uh, the theater area right down the, the walkway to what would have been in Paul's day a seaport um, that's silted in now, so there's not the seaport there, but uh, in Paul's day, uh, it would have been a seaport, uh, and as you would, I can just ima- I can just in my mind see you know the ships sitting in the harbor, looking up into the city at night with the uh, the lights, uh, the, the torches lit, and the the marble streets glistening. <laughs> uh, it's, it's amazing. You, you go there. We went to a Beth Shean when we were over in Israel, and we walked down the main street in Beth Shean. It was marble, marble, <laughs> marble streets. It's, you know, how beautiful it must have been uh, in its heyday to, to see that area. But they had a need, and their need was Jesus. And Paul's ministry to the Christians there, to those who believed, um, had a great, huge impact. Uh, our, Wednesday, our Thursday night study, we've been learning about taking the gospel and moving outside our world into a global, um, uh, global ministry of making disciples. And... Uh, if you follow the picture in the book of Acts, you see that happening. Acts 2 in Jerusalem, Acts 8, Samaria and Judea, Acts 10, moving farther out uh, 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 into the Judean hillsides and countryside. And Acts chapter 19, we go uh, 18 and 19, all the way over to Ephesus. So the global ministry of the gospel is spreading, and Paul um, is an active part of that. We're going to look at the power that this church needed that Paul talks about here in our study this morning. Um, Three people were arguing about what profession was used first in the Bible. The surgeon said the medical profession was first used when God took a rib from Adam and made Eve. There was an engineer in the group, and the engineer said, no, 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 engineering was used first. Just think of the engineering job it took to create the world out of chaos. Of course, there had to be a politician in the group, and the politician said, you would have nothing if we didn't create chaos in the beginning. <laughs> you know, 
that's what politicians do. They create the chaos in the beginning. I think politicians probably see themselves as men and women of power, but I think most Americans view them as people who create more chaos than they do solving problems. Power is not found in politics. The power that we seek is found here in the Word of God. Job chapter 1, verse 21 says, Who said these words and under what conditions? Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That's where the power is. Power comes from God. There's none other than Job of old who said these words after losing everything, after he'd lost everything, including his children. Actually, he lost all of his livestock, which represented all of his wealth, and he lost 10 of his children. And yet he praised the name of the Lord. How could he do that? How could someone suffering at the height of incredible loss find time to look at God and say, thank you, God, for who you are? That's, that's, that's real power in action. Verse 22 of the same chapter in Job. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. How could Job not feel badly toward God after losing his wealth and especially his children? How could Job endure this great loss? There may be a reason for that. It may be found in Job 1.1. It says that in the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. That's how the book of Job starts. It starts by reminding us that Job was a man who found his power, his sense of centering for his life, his north star, if you will, in the person of God. He feared God. Not only did he fear God, but as a part of that, he shunned evil. And I think probably one of the great questions we should probably pause to ask this morning is, could that be said of me? Do I fear God by having this great sense of respect for him? Do I emphasize that by the way I walk in faith in my life? Is my faith in God as strong as Job's faith? He knew that God was doing what was best, and he was willing to accept whatever God put on him. That's that's real faith. And sometimes the most difficult prayers to pray are times when people you love are in great moments of distress and you ask God to reach down and to either spare a life or to extend grace to the situation and and then you are cautious to be reminded that we need to pray in the will of God and we say but above all I want your will to be done and those are hard prayers hard words to say the fact that he shunned evil he did not participate in the evil that the world around him did is a demonstration of his tremendous faith. The peer pressure of the culture was intense, and yet he endured all these losses. His Christian friends, his Christian friends, came alongside him to encourage him, and their word of encouragement was, curse God and die. (laughs) Well, that's a great... With friends like that, who needs enemies? He had tremendous faith. And with all his losses, he still praised God. The story is told of a Texas famous oil field known as Yates Pool. During the Depression, this field was a sheep ranch owned by a man named Yates. Mr. Yates was not able to make enough money in his ranching operation to pay the principal and interest on the mortgage, so he was in danger of losing his ranch. With little money for clothes or food, his family, like many others, had to live on the generosity of a government subsidy. Day after day, he grazed his sheep. He wondered how he would be able to pay his bills. Then, a seismograph crew from the oil company came into the area and told Mr. Yates that there might be oil on his land. They asked permission to drill a wildcat well, and he signed a lease. At 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. The first well came in 
at, at 80,000 barrels a day. That's a lot of oil. Many of the wells later were even twice as large. 30 years later, after the first well was drilled, all the wells still had the potential of pumping 125,000 barrels of oil a day. And Mr. Yates owned it, all of it. The day he purchased the property, he received the oil and mineral rights, and he was living on government, assist, government assist, uh, assistance, and he was sitting on this wealth of oil. He was a multimillionaire, and he didn't know it, and he was living in poverty. What was the problem? He didn't know the oil was there. He owned it, but he had no idea that it was there. You get where the illustration's going here? <laughs> I think sometimes that's pretty similar to how we as Christians go through life. We have some really good things available to us in Christ, and Ephesians is about life in Christ, right? Ephesians chapter 1, in Christ. But many times we don't even realize it, and we don't put the things to use in our everyday lives, and one of them is the power to overcome obstacles and difficulties in life. I'm not talking about, you know, that God is our little lucky rabbit's foot that we rub whenever we have a problem. It's good. It's from God. And it's ours if we just avail ourselves of it. So Paul's going to tell us in our chapter and our study today how do we receive power in three areas of our lives? The first area being through prayer, the second area being through the Spirit, and the third area being through the love of Christ. Verse 16 tells us, I pray out of this glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being. His glorious riches, and he may strengthen you with power. Riches is a high point at any scale and having the implication of value. Riches tells us there is value here, that, that there is an abundance. And the abundance of possessions exceeding the norm of a particular society. We like abundance. We like when we have, when, when my wife makes um, shepherd's pie, I like an abundance of potatoes in the mix. When she makes meat pie, I like abundance of drop biscuits that she makes to put on top. Mm. Excuse me while I go have a snack, you know. Um, we, we like abundance. When we go to the bank and there's more money in our account than we thought there was, we like the abundance. That's a good thing. And what Paul is talking to this group of people about is the abundance that they have. The glorious riches, the glorious riches. Not dollars and cents, but a different kind of riches. Riches that are going to strengthen us and provide us with the power that we need through the Spirit of God in the very inner part. It's said to have said, I have so much to do that I spend several hours in prayer before I'm able to do it. Perhaps that's the reason that some of us are not as successful as we would like to be because we just don't expend enough time. We don't think we have the time to pray because we're so busy in our lives, and yet the reality is we are never too busy to pray. Wesley traveled 250 miles a day for 40 years. It's probably not possible. <laughs> It's probably more like 17 miles a day. He did ride over 250,000 miles in his lifetime. That's a lot of riding around when you don't have motor transportation. He preached 40,000 sermons. He used, preached two or three times a day. He produced 400 books. You talk about prolific. He knew 10 languages. Most of us struggle with English. At 83 years of age, 
He was annoyed that he could not stay awake to write more than 15 hours a day without his eyes hurting. And at 86, he was ashamed he could not preach more than twice a day. He complained in his diary that there was an increasing tendency to lie in bed until the hour of 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> I, I think that that's a pretty remarkable tale of a man's life. And I, I have to say, when I read that, it makes me think of my dad, <laughs> who is in his mid-90s and still preps a message every day or every week at his computer as God gives him grace and starts a Bible study in his in his nursing home so he can have an audience to share Jesus with. Kind of Wesley-ish. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln said, and I think you've heard of him before, he said, I have been driven many times to my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had absolutely no other place to go. Well, that sounds good, I, I think, you know. I wonder why Abraham Lincoln wanted to go any other place before going to God in prayer, but why not turn to God first? <laughs> why don't we turn to God first? It's like what Corey Ten Boom, you probably have heard of her, said about prayer. She said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? <laughs> I think we as believers should think about making prayer our steering wheel instead of our spare tire. We should put uh, the Carrie Underwood song, Jesus Take the Wheel, into our vocabulary as a part of what we really need to do in our lives. Preacher Philip Brooks said this, Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your power. Pray for powers equal to your task. Whatever God calls a person to do, it can be done with God's strength. And we must ask him for that strength. I had a professor in college that used to challenge us as students, well, in seminary actually, that used to challenge us as students, and he would say, when you have a role in ministry, you need to pray for things that are bigger than the things that you can accomplish. Because when God blesses and those things are accomplished, people will know it wasn't you that accomplished them, it was God. And I think that's a great way to think about what God can do in our lives and through our lives when we trust him to do the big things. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11 Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good, good gifts to those who ask him? The reality is that God loves us. God wants the best for us. We need to ask God for his best. Luke chapter 11, verse 1 says, One day Jesus was preaching in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. There should be a desire on the hearts of every believer to learn how to be mindful in prayer and to look for opportunities to seek the power that God provides for our lives through prayer. And Paul talks about that power here in Ephesians. He wants the church at Ephesus to experience the power that comes as they pray and ask God for things. Think of who they were and where they were. They were in the midst of a Roman multi-God culture. Polytheism abounded. There were gods everywhere for everything. The Roman emperor demanded that they acknowledge him as deity. It was on the coins. They had to somehow, somehow offer some kind of obeisance to the deity of the emperor Caesar as they went into the, 
Agora to buy their groceries and their clothes. Challenging for believers in the church. And in all this, Paul says, you need to ask God for the big things. And you need to be diligent in prayer. Because that's where your power comes from. And the power that Paul was praying for for the church at Ephesus is no different than the power that each and every one of us has at our disposal as we come in prayer before a holy God. The disciples wanted to learn to pray. (laughs) Why did the disciples ask Jesus to teach them to pray? What did they see in the prayer life of Jesus that made them want to pray? If Jesus, who was God, took time to pray to his Father, how much more should you and I, who are mere mortals... (laughs) evil men, as Jesus described them in the text we read above, desire to have a relationship with our holy God through prayer. There is power through prayer. Not because of who we are, not because there's something special about the way we pray, but there is something special about the God to whom we pray. When I was a teenager, I attended a young Christian leadership training seminar at, uh, at that time Baptist Bible I think it was still called Baptist Bible Seminary then. It was a weekend they had for, for, for high school it was a week for high school kids to come and be exposed to, the, to God's word and, and the speaker we had, hard to believe this and you may find it hard, I, when I look back I find it hard to believe but the speaker we had for that week was Dr. David Jeremiah He was our speaker for the week. A bunch of kids, and David Jeremiah was our speaker. And um, he uh, challenged us to um, not be praying the trite prayers that we learned as a a child. You know, the the meaningless rote repetitions of phrases. Um, You know, God is great, God is good. Now we thank him for this food. Amen. And I thought that was pretty, pretty good. He had, uh, you know, he, there was a little book he, that he was using to talk about, and it was called Games Christians Play, and it was talking about how you know, sometimes people bring their prayer requests because they want the attention, or they want to pinpoint somebody. We need to pray for Sister, Sister Amy Carroll. I saw her this week walking into the liquor store, so she needs God's grace, so we better be praying for her, you know. Or I saw Pastor Maddox buy a bottle of vodka at the pick and save this week. I did. I'm making vanilla. <laughs> um, I mean, so, so you know, the, the reality is we need to have something behind our prayers other than just words. When I, was a, my, when I was a boy, my dad challenged me one time. He said, Bill, he said, when you, we took turns as kids praying for the meals, you know, and he said, you always, you always pray the same thing, you know, and you, you pray, you know, you know, Dear Lord, thank you for the food, amen, or whatever. And he said, you should just number your prayers. He said, you know, just have two or three different ones, number them, say, dear God, number one, amen. Dear God, number two, amen. And that challenged me to think, because I think so many times when we pray, we just say words. We don't really think about what we're praying for. And So you can teach your kids, Stephanie and Zach, number one, prayer, number two, prayer, number three, prayer. There is also power through the Spirit. Verse 16 says, through His Spirit in your inner being. Power through His Spirit. An American with an English gentleman was viewing the Niagara Niagara River Whirlpool Rapids when he said to his friend, come, come. I'll show you the greatest unused power in the world. And taking him to the foot of Niagara, he said, there, that is the greatest unused power in the world. I want you to know, if you've never been to Niagara Falls and you ever get the chance to go to Niagara Falls, it is an amazing thing. And if you get a chance to go, you should, whatever the cost is, pay to take the little Maid of the Mist boat ride that takes you out by the falls and you experience the power of the falls. You might have seen the movie Superman, and you might have seen Superman flying over the falls. 
that ain't nothing compared to being there. It's an amazing sight to see. But as this gentleman was being shown the power of the Niagara Falls, the uh, other person said, oh, no, my brother, not so, he said. The greatest unused power in the world is the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And I think there's a lot of truth to the story that the Holy Spirit is a great source of power. The, the, the definition that we get in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power, dunamas. That is, that is not power. You know, there is power in the blood. There is power in the Holy Spirit. It's power! You know, it's, a, it's the idea of incredibly strong power that comes from the Holy Spirit in our lives. I, I think probably that's one of the greatest needs we have today. Dwight L. Moody is said to have said that we didn't have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit had a monopoly on him as he sought God's blessing on his ministry. And I think that's our need today. The Holy Spirit needs to have a monopoly on our lives, and when he does, we will experience a greater sense of power for life and for service. The great prayer warrior E.M. Bounds wrote these words, the church is looking for better methods, God is looking for better men, the Holy Spirit does not flow through methods but through men, he does not come on machinery but on men, he does not anoint plans but he anoints men, men of prayer, E.M. Bounds, if you've never read anything by E.M. Bounds, he's a great, great guy to read on the theme of prayer, he will challenge you, he will make you feel somehow inferior in your prayer life because he was a great prayer warrior. D.L. Moody said, I firmly believe that the moment our hearts are emptied of pride and selfishness and ambition and everything that is contrary to God's law, the Holy Spirit will fill every corner of our hearts. It's like, let the garbage out and let God's love and the Holy Spirit in. You as a believer at the moment of your salvation receive the Holy Spirit. And honestly, you never have any more of the Holy Spirit in your life than you have at your conversion. But the, the, the quality of that relationship you have with the Holy Spirit inside you depends on how much of the Holy Spirit you are willing to allow to take over and be used in your life. We're full of pride and conceit and ambition and the world. And there is little or no room for the Spirit of God in many lives. We must be empty before we can be filled. We must be empty before we can be filled. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble and also the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is indeed the third person of the Godhead, and he is, then we need him just as much as we need God in our lives. He is no less important to your spiritual growth than your relationship with God the Father and God the Son. The Holy Spirit is a real person. I think sometimes we as Baptists are afraid to talk about the Holy Spirit or to try to understand what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives and in our world or to embrace that because we're, gonna, we're afraid we're going to sound like charismatics. And we don't want to sound like charismatics, so we sort of stifle the Holy Spirit use in our lives. First Thessalonians chapter 5 says, don't quench the Spirit. <laughs> don't quench the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to do what it chooses to do in our lives. God, God, Jesus told us that he was leaving the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, Jesus told us that there would be a comforter who would come. Listen to what he says in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 13. But I tell you the truth, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not be able to come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes... 
He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you can see me no longer. In regard to judgment, because the prince of the world now stands condemned. Satan, that is. I have come, I have much to say to you, more than you can bear now. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit guides us into truth. What a great thing. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you'll receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. shall be witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. Verse 16 again. I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit in your inner being the very core of who we are will be strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. In reality, the Holy Spirit can and will strengthen our innermost being if we ask God for his strength. But if we don't ask, does that mean we have to go it alone? without help. I don't like to do things on my own most of the time. I want to rely on God's Spirit to strengthen me for life and service. I can't teach or preach or serve without His help. Now, maybe you can, but I can't. I don't think you can either, honestly. The third, the third concept of here, prayer, the Holy Spirit, and through love. Power through love. Verse 17 of our text this morning, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know his love this, that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Rooted, established in love. Uh, that's, I think it's hard to imagine anything that would be better than that. Rooted, established in love. And when you love like God loves people, there's great power. How do we know? How do we come to understand God's love in all its fullness? Sadly, struggle. <laughs> we understand God's grace and his love and his compassion and his care and, and how much he wants to fill our lives with his goodness most at the times when we struggle the most. It's the struggle that allows us to see God's grace in action. In the last century, when Napoleon's armies opened a prison that had been used by the Spanish Inquisition, they found the remains of a prisoner who had been incarcerated for his faith. The dungeon was deep underground. The body had long since decayed, and only a chain fastened around the ankle bone cried out to determine his confinement. But this prisoner, long since dead, had left a witness. On the wall of his small, dismal cell, this faithful follower of Jesus Christ has scratched a rough cross with four words surrounding it, written in Spanish. Above the cross was the Spanish word height. Below was the word depth. On the, on the left was the word width, and on the right was the word length. Clearly, this prisoner was talking about the surpassing greatness of God's love for him in the deepest, darkest struggle of his life, suffering more than we could imagine. It's how we come to understand God's love in its fullness measure by seeing what God is doing in our lives. When do we see that the most? When we struggle. 
for those of us who feel like our Christian faith should be a ticket to glory with nothing bothering us along the way, we are sadly mistaken the first time we find a crisis with one of our children or a loved one, a parent, or a spouse, a sibling who struggles with some kind of significant health problem, and we struggle with them in that deep moment of despair and desperation. We cry out to God, and we feel the embrace of his love that brings us comfort and hope, knowing that no matter what happens in this lifetime, what he has pre- I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, God's promise to us, I will come again to receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you can be also. That's an amazing promise of God's love for us. Where I am, there you can be also. It's fun to go places with people we love and share things, isn't it? I mean, sometimes, you know, I can remember when I was traveling for, for my sales job that I had, sometimes I would travel to a place and I would say, oh, I wish my wife could be here to see this with me, to experience this. And she'll go to maybe to Florida and visit her brother and she'll come back, or to England, she went to England, I stayed behind and she came back, she told me all the things she saw there. And she said, I wish you could come and see it too, you know. We, we love to share the things that are most special with the people that we love the most. God's going to prepare a place for us that where I am, there you may be also. You and I have that to look forward to. The promise of eternity and the presence of Jesus to enjoy his presence forever. Here, here's a story of love. I... Don't know if you know who Jim Cimbala is, but Jim Cimbala is the pastor of Brooklyn Tabernacle Church. Um, He wrote uh, a few books, uh, one of which is a book uh, which is all about prayer. It's a great book. I would, if you've never read it, I forget the title of it, but if you've never read it, I would encourage you to read that book. It's an easy read, and it's an encouraging read. Cimbala preaches at a church which is in the slums of New York, Brooklyn Tabernacle. And he tells the following story. It was Easter Sunday and so tired at the end of the day that he says, I went to the edge of the platform, pulled down my tie, and sat down and draped my feet over the edge. It was a wonderful service and many people had come forward. The counselors were talking with these people and as I was sitting there, I looked up the middle of the aisle and there about the third row was a man who looked to be about 50, disheveled, filthy. He looked up at me rather sheepishly as if saying, could I talk to you? We have homeless people, he says, coming in all the time asking for money or whatever. So I sat there and I said to myself, well, I'm ashamed of it. (laughs) What a way to end a Sunday. I've had such a good time preaching and ministering and there's a fellow probably wanting money so he can go out and buy some more wine. Cymbala uh, walked up to the man and he got within about five feet of him. He says, I smelled a horrible smell like I've never smelled in my life. It was so awful that when he got close, I would inhale by looking away, and then I'd talk to him, and then look away to inhale because I couldn't inhale facing him. I asked him, what's his name? And he said, David. How long have you been on the street? Six years. How old are you? 32. He looked 50, hair matted, front teeth missing. He was a wino, eyes slightly glazed. Where did you sleep last night, David? In a truck, an abandoned truck. I keep in my back pocket a money clip that holds some of some credit cards, and I fumbled to pick one out, thinking I'll give him some money. I won't even get a volunteer. They're also busy talking with others. Usually we don't give money to people, but we usually take them out and buy them something to eat. I took the money out. David pushed his fingers in front of me and said, I don't want your money. I want your Jesus. The one you were just talking about. Because I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die on the street. Cymbala says, I started to weep for myself. I was going to give him a couple of dollars. 
um, to someone God had sent to me. See how easy it is? I could make the excuse that I was tired. There is no excuse. I was not seeing him the way God sees him. I was not feeling what God feels. But all did that change. David just stood there. He didn't know what was happening. I pleaded with God, God, forgive me. Forgive me. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry to represent you this way. I'm so sorry. Here I am with my message and my points, and you send somebody, and I am not ready for it. Something came over me. Suddenly I started to weep deeper, and David began to weep. He fell against my chest as I was sitting there. He fell against my white shirt and tie, <laughs> and I put my arms around him, and there we wept on each other. The smell of his person became a beautiful aroma. Here is what I thought the Lord made real to me. If you don't love this smell, I can't use you, because this is why I called you where you are. This is what you are about. You are about this smell. <laughs> Christ changed David's life. He started memorizing portions of Scripture that were incredible. He got him to live a place to live. We hired him in the church to do maintenance, and he got his teeth fixed. He was a handsome man when he came out of the hospital. They detoxed him in six days. He spent that Thanksgiving at my house. He spent Christmas at my house. When we were uh, exchanging presents, he pulled out a little thing, and he said, this is for you. And it was a little white hanky. It was the only thing he could afford. <laughs> A year later, David got up and talked about his conversion to Christ. The minute he took the mic um, and began to speak, I said, the man is a preacher. <laughs> this past Easter Sunday, we ordained David. He's an associate minister at our church. And I was so close to saying, here, take this. I'm a busy preacher. We can get so full of ourselves. There is incredibly great power in living a life of love. That's love. That's love. Paul closes this section with a doxological statement. And here it is, powerful words. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Father, we're thankful for uh, the word of God and the lessons that we can learn from it. So many times we are captivated by our sense of self-worth, our perception of duty to the call that's on our life. And sometimes we just fail to grasp the significance of why we are here. I pray that you would help us to be mindful of the needs of people. I pray that you would help us to have hearts that are that are empowered by prayer, that are open to the Holy Spirit's moving in our lives and by the love that you gave to us that we might share it with others. Thank you for that love. Thank you for the beautiful picture that we share even now as we partake in this communion table of a God who loved us so much that he was willing to do the ultimate thing, send his only son, his one and only son, his perfect without sin son to this earth to take on our sin, to become the punishment for our sin, to love us so much that he was willing to die, to give his life, to purchase our redemption. Help us to love with that same kind of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have...
the elements of communion in front of us this morning. We have juice representing the wine that Jesus shared with his disciples at the Last Supper. And we have the bread. The bread represented the body of Christ and um, two elements of everyday life in Jerusalem in Jesus' day. Two elements that every person that was a part of that family of believers would have experienced every day of their lives. Interesting how Jesus takes common everyday things and uses them to tell a broader story. And as Jesus was with his disciples in the upper room, he said to them, them not really understanding or knowing what was about to take, take place, he said, this, is, this bread, as they broke the bread together, he said, this bread which you're breaking with me now, essentially, represents my body which is going to be broken for you. You don't get it now, in parentheses we're saying, this is not inspired text. You don't get it now, but you will get it pretty soon. When you look back on this moment, you will understand what it is that I'm saying. My body, broken for you. I, I often wonder what they thought when they, heard, when they heard that. How is, he works hard, he walked a lot of miles today, he's tired, no. They had no clue as to what brokenness was going to look like. Jesus said to them, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. I want you to do this and eat this. And when you eat this, I, I want this to be a thing that reminds you. When you come together in this place or any other place with your fellow believers and you share in this meal, I want you to remember that it represents me. It's it's your way of acknowledging that as you are in Christ, I am in you and I am with you. As we share this together, we cannot see him physically, but Jesus is in this room with us. He is everywhere equally present at once. So as we do this, we share with him this implementation of the gospel story and remember with gratitude what he has done for us. The first element that they used was bread. I say this almost every time. I probably should say it every time. Sometimes I forget. This does not save you. This is, there is there's nothing unique about the bread or the juice. Welch's grape juice. Joe's bread. Nothing special. What's special is the understanding that as we partake of this, we acknowledge this great sacrifice which was given on our behalf. It's our way to celebrate and memorialize what Jesus has done for us. So as we share this, I would ask you to retain your portion until we can all partake together. And as we do that, I'd ask you to be mindful of who Jesus is, what he's done for you and the price that was paid for your eternal salvation. Father, we thank you for the representation of this bread. I'm thankful that we, as individuals, do not have to suffer the penalty for our sin because there's no way that we could somehow be meritorious enough that we could somehow forgive ourselves by doing all the good things in the world. We would still be sinful creatures. And the only thing that makes us acceptable in your sight is the work of Jesus which covers us with his blood so that you no longer see us as sinners but as righteous individuals justified before you through the blood of Christ. Through the body of Christ. Through the work of Jesus on the cross. And so we thank you for that today. And I pray that as we partake of this bread We'll be mindful of your body, which was bloodied and broken on our behalf. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, please retain your portion until we can all partake together.
Jesus said to his disciples, this bread represents my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Please join me. I remember as a young teenager sitting through communion service after communion service at our little church in Marathon, New York, not really being connected to what was taking place in front of me. I mean, my teenage friends and I would sit in the back and we would, we would have a Baptist wager on who my dad was going to call on to pray for the cup and who he was going to call on to pray for the bread, you know. Pretty sacrilegious when you stop to think of it, for a preacher's kid especially. I've grown up a little since then, and I realize there's a whole lot more to it than just eating a piece of bread and drinking a cup of juice. And this blood, this juice represents the blood of Jesus, the, the most precious element on the planet. Um, where there is no blood, there is no life. And where there is no life, there is hopelessness and despair and darkness. Jesus came into our world to bring light and to bring life to all who would believe. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and yet without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Jesus' sacrifice was necessary, and it purchased our redemption. It's not important for us to actually have a piece of the cross or a drop of the blood of Jesus somehow preserved for all eternity in a vial somewhere or some shroud someplace in a museum which shows us the, the visage of a beaten man who we think may be Jesus. What matters is that we understand what took place. And we have this opportunity to, via a memorial service, remember what Christ has done for us. Father, as we share this cup this morning, I pray that you would help us to somehow, in some small way at least, comprehend the, the depth of the sacrifice which was made possible by what you have done for us. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from our sin, which makes reconciliation with a holy God possible, which opens the gates of eternity with Jesus in the heavenlies for us. As we partake together, help us to remind, be mindful that we share this with you in this moment, and we remember what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, I ask you please retain your portion so that we can all share together. One of the last times Jesus was together with his disciples before his crucifixion, he shared with them in this supper, this meal together. And as they prepared to share this cup together, Jesus told them, this blood represents the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. Please join me.
Please stand with me as we'll sing, and then you can be dismissed to uh, share some time in the fellowship in the foyer before our annual meeting. Uh, we're going to sing Oh, the Blood of Jesus again. Eh? It's a great song. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of of Jesus, it washes white as snow. Thank you for your attention this morning. Take some time to fellowship in the foyer, and then we will announce the start of the meeting. We'll have a, um, well, I will place on the, in the back of the auditorium uh, the sheets of our business uh, stuff. You're just